data is often analyzed by clustering, where in particular we desire high similarity within each cluster and low similarity between clusters. K-nearest neighbor graphs tend not to be highly clustered, but they can be a good place to start. Two important aspects of clustering. Data could occur in isolated clusters, in which case our goal is to find the clusters. We've actually seen an example of this in the sub-economy problem. Uh, in general, this tends to be a pretty difficult problem. But data may be reflective of communities of communities of communities, for example, Facebook, and such communities are far from isolated, even though highly clustered. For example, hubs are highly clustered. Sub-economy graphs are completely clustered in the sense that they're transitive. A is adjacent to B and A adjacent to C implies that B is adjacent to C. A union of disconnected components where each component is completely connected is still completely clustered. For example, a sub-economy graph. Well, let's suppose we add a few edges. Then we get connected communities. But it matters how we add the edges. Suppose we got U and V. And notice we've just put an edge from one cluster to the next in this setup. And the shortest path from U to V has a length of 14. So if you have lots of clusters hooked up in this sort of way, you'll have very large path lengths. Now, it, you can add a few edges in a different way. Real world tends to add edges so as to have a small, shortest path length. So here you see that the distance between any two vertices is less than or equal to 3. So therefore, it must be that uh, L of G is less than or equal to 3. Remember, typically N is very large. K is much smaller than N. And this means that a nearest neighbor graph is like a random network with small p, except that they tend to be small world. They tend to have small average shortest path lengths, and they tend to be highly clustered, and they tend to be scale free. What about the result of the k nearest neighbors algorithm? Well, when we first run the k nearest neighbors algorithm, we're going to end up with a directed graph with uh, a uniform out degree. But can we say a directed graph is scale free or not scale free? Or is small world or not small world? Now, it's hard to talk about these concepts with direct graphs, so we transform to an undirected graph. There's three ways we could do this. We could take the directed graph itself and just say that each directed edge will just automatically become an edge in an undirected graph. We could add an edge if you have two vertices and you're thinking about adding an edge between them you could say well if either one has fewer than k neighbors then we'll add the edge. Or you could add the edge only if both vertices have fewer than, than k neighbors. So the option two is often called the or option. If the first vertex has degree less than k or the second has degree less than k. And the third option is often called the and option. It's only, edge is only added if both the first vertex and the last vertex have fewer than k neighbors. So let's look at uh, how this works out in the quote real world. So let's suppose we take a difficult case of a thousand approximately equidistant observations. So in the first case, we've used our first algorithm in correct, connect, creating our undirected nearest neighbor graph where k is equal to 50. And if we look at that in log log space, then uh, sort of a straight line, so it's not terrible. Uh, the 
length of the shortest path or the average shortest path length is about 2. That's not too bad. But the clustering coefficient is 0 0.053. And this is only a thousand vertices. So that's not very good. Remember, Facebook's highly clustered with uh, billions of vertices, and the K is about 70. So let's look at how the second algorithm does. Well, it looks sort of scale free, and there's the log log plot of that histogram. Eh, it's not too bad. The average shortest path length, eh, it's not too bad. But again, the clustering coefficient is not very good. What about the AND option? So notice this is where uh, both vertices have to be below K, in this case below 50 before you add an edge, and so notice that that means that most of the vertices fill up to the 50, uh, the degree 50 upper bound. The path length is actually a little bit longer, slightly, and again, not very good clustering. In fact, in general, the K nearest neighbors algorithm doesn't tend to produce hubs. Now, that doesn't mean that the K nearest neighbors algorithm is a bad algorithm. As a matter of fact, the last scenario, the AND option, where you have the upper bound of 50 on the degree of every vertex, that turns out to be the best approach and the one we're going to use. And the reason is because the K nearest neighbor algorithm is a model of a larger structure. So let's suppose that everyone was exactly the same distance apart. Then in the real world, in the Facebook world, we would have a billion connected vertices. So that would be a complete graph, an extremely huge complete graph with huge numbers of edges. What happens if you apply a K nearest neighbors algorithm to it? Well, the choice of K is arbitrary, and we always choose K much smaller than N. Uh, for computational reasons if for no other reason. And the algorithm produces a sparse sample of a complete graph. And notice because it's a sparse sample of a complete graph there really aren't any hubs because no vertex is any more likely to be a hub than any other and shouldn't be. And we should expect each vertex to have approximately the same degree, just because of the way the K nearest neighbors algorithm samples from this complete graph. Now this is a good representation of the data, but it's not highly clustered. Now what about another worst case scenario, a grid graph? Here everyone has approximately the same number of neighbors. In the case of the, the, the grid here, it's exactly the same number of neighbors. But notice the way we have it set up. From one side of the uh, grid to the other, as the grid becomes large, the distance across the grid also becomes very large. And so the shortest average path length is going to grow as the grid grows in size. So therefore our K nearest neighbors algorithm should create a sampling of this structure that has some long path links. And it does, if we use the AND option. Because method 3 the and, with the AND option is faithful to the underlying structure of the grid graph and the complete graph and in general the data that we're looking at. So we're not going to use methods 1 and 2, collapse the undirected or use the OR option. We're going to have upper bound of K uh, when we do the undirected graph representation of K nearest neighbors. Now can a graph be scale free and small world? Well let's look at an example where this actually happens. So what we do is we implement the rich get richer. And this is called the Barabasi Albert model, the BA model. And we'll just re keep repeating the following over and over. You start with some graph. For instance, we could start with a K nearest neighbors graph. And we connect new nodes uh, 
So we add a, a brand new node and we connect it to a node V in the existing graph with probability of the degree over the sum of the degrees. This means that the higher the degree, the more likely you are to get a new vertex. And this is known as preferential attachment. So here's an example of the BA model. There's a BA graph for n equals 100. For n equals 1,000, notice that you see the, the degree distribution is power law, at least eventually. The vertices tend to be close together. And we have, you know, the clustering coefficient 0 0.638, so it's modestly high clustering. So you could, in some sense, say this is, in some sense, a scale-free small world network. But it's not a panacea. Theoretically, the degree distribution uh, converges to k to the negative 3, which is independent of n. So actually, the BA model is always scale-free, but it's only small world for small n. So you can show that the clustering coefficient goes approximately as n to the negative 0 0.75, and that goes to 0 as n becomes very large whereas the shortest average path length goes to infinity as n becomes very large. So let's get back to the goal. We want to improve the recommender system by making the underlying graph more real world. In other words, we want to rewire toward being scale free and we want to stop when the graph becomes small world. And later on we'll actually explore a different version of this idea which is clustering, which as we said in the intro is where you try to get highly similar clusters and low similarity between clusters. We'll be looking at it in just a limited case, just two classes. And if we had two different classes of data, the ideal clustering representation would be two disjoint complete graphs, kind of like a sub-economy model. So what's next? Well, we're going to be looking at assignment 2 next. We'll start it next week. So it's an exploration of k-nearest neighbor graphs, constructing imputation, creating a recommender system, and we're going to do it in terms of the small town zoo. However, the midterm is going to explore two real-world data sets, one of which will be the movie lens data. Now, we'll be rewiring the k nearest neighbors at that point and measuring the results. In particular, we're going to be exploring this idea of improving on the k nearest neighbor graph representation. Now, why are we going to not do this with the small town zoo? Well, because it's simulated and therefore it's good for instruction only. One thing that we learned very quickly, we in the computational science, data scientist community, is you can't really simulate big data only truly complex systems. Complexity meaning highly nonlinear, a mixture of regular and chaotic motion, and an extremely large number of degrees of freedom. So 10 to the 54th, 10 to the 23rd, something like that. So only these kind of systems can produce what we would actually call big data. So the movie lens data is big data, but the simulated data is not going to have the properties that real world actual big data sets have.